Hi, everyone, and welcome to this session uh, with Dina Hagag on adding creatives to a workers' movement, part of today's theme of reimagination and resilience. We will have time at the end for a quick Q&A, um, but feel free to add your questions in the Q&A box at any time during the session, during the presentation. And with that, on behalf of Americans for the Arts, let's get started. And I will hand it off to President and CEO of the United States Artists, Zina Hagak. Thank you. Um, so many familiar names. Hi, friends. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, thank you to Heather and Chelsea, and also to Denise, our um, uh, closed captioning transcriber. I've been thinking a lot about access in our work at USA and in my personal life and um, it just is always so overwhelmingly lovely when people actually use closed captioning and um, various other tools to help all kinds of folks join us. Um, as mentioned, I work for United States Artists and um, recently United States Artists joined a coalition of six other nonprofit partners to start the Artist Relief Fund uh, to help artists who are facing sort of uh, dire financial emergencies due to COVID-19. Uh, to date, we have funded about 1,400 artists and have offered each of them a $5,000 grant uh, to take care of their rent, medication, groceries, anything that they really might be facing right now as a lack of, um, due to a lack of cash flow. Um, one thing that um, has been a little startling for us, excuse me, uh, one thing that has been a little startling for us is that um, we have had almost 90,000 people apply uh, since we opened the fund on April 8th. Um, it is a multidisciplinary and uh, hyper-national fund. Uh, so we are funding artists all over the country um, in every range of practice from craft to dance, film, theater, music, visual art. And uh, one thing I think we've really realized is that um, across all of these economies, artists are struggling um, and that artists are a workforce and a workforce that is not often always considered that way by the powers that be. And we've been trying to wonder what are things that would have lessened this pool? Uh, what are infrastructures that would have made it so that 90,000 people weren't applying uh, desperately for these funds at this very, very critical time? Um, one thing we were also doing early in the Artist Relief Fund is sort of talking to all kinds of folks that were offering aid to their communities right now. Many of them were in the arts, uh, like Surf and the folks at Joan Mitchell and all the folks affiliated with NCAPER. And some were not. Some were folks who, you know, really served domestic workers alliances, transportation workers, restaurant workers. Um, and we learned a lot about all the different ways that uh, individuals in the gig economy are not protected. And some of the findings in our pool really matched the findings in theirs, right? That if folks had access to um, unemployment insurance, health care, um, various degrees of potable insurances, they just wouldn't be applying for this pool as readily. Um, all of this conversation, all of these conversations with these various other organizing groups seem to be going pretty well until we hit a pretty significant snag, um, which I do want to bring up here with this group because I do think it is incredibly important as we consider sort of um, considering artists as a creative workforce that aligns with other workforces, which I do want to say as an art practitioner um, and as someone who comes from a working class background, like I 100% advocate for, but one snag that kept coming up, which I hope we can discuss together on this call is this issue of class. And right now in moments where coalitions are rising all over the country to really think about workers' rights, do artists and creative workers really get to situate themselves in that space? It happened for us most notably at Artist Relief a few weeks ago when the New York Times published an article about our work and referred to artists as a labor group, a largely working class one, and within 30 minutes of the publication of that article, they took it down um, because the editors there did not feel comfortable referring to artists as a largely working class labor group and thought that that really opened up lots of nuance that they weren't able to have in that article. I wanted to prepare something very eloquent about how we think about professionalizing artists in the workers' class, and I have some thoughts, but before we get there, I actually wanted to share a very quick video, um, namely because uh, it is by a brilliant scholar, Julia Bryan Wilson, who is an art historian at UC Berkeley. And at, one, at a certain point, I was literally like plagiarizing every single word of Julia's remarks. So I was like, I may as well just play this thing. So if you'll bear with me, I, I really wanna play this. And then I wanna talk about some of the patterns we've seen at Artist Relief, some ideas we have moving forward, and then I'd love to open it for conversation. Um, but here's just some thoughts on how we think about artist professionalism in class um, as we start to think about advocating for larger worker movements. Um, Let's see. 
I hope everybody here can see my screen. Oh, let's put that out of the way. Can somebody just indicate that we can see it uh, and hear it? Maybe Chelsea or Heather? I can see your screen. Um, if you cut up the volume just a little bit. Okay. Oh, so sorry about that. So sound is not working right now? Oh, we tested this earlier. Let's see. Um, I should be able to correct this pretty quickly. Hmm. When you click on share screen, there's a little arrow button right beside it. Make sure mm -hmm. that you say that it says, you know, share your computer sound also. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, let's try this one more time. <laughs> the final speaker in the first round is Julia Brian Wilson. <clears throat> Before I get to the many meanings of the word professionalize, let me also emphasize that there is no such thing as a stable single category of artist. Who are these artists that we're talking about? Are they the barely scraping by practitioners with adjunct teaching jobs on the side to pay the rent in a nation with no state support for the arts? Are they newly graduated art students burdened by debt in a country with robust national funding? Are they village artisans struggling for survival by organizing collectives to protect their local handicrafts? There are so many kinds of activity and so many different identities in so many divergent contexts that one could corral under the rubric of artist that it begins to fray at the seams. Instead of asking a sweeping question like should artists professionalize, let's pay attention to local circumstances and specific histories in which this issue might ramify quite unevenly. When we speak from a space of empire in the 21st century, the question has long ago been answered. Starting in the Renaissance, when art began to define itself as a vocation rather than as a calling, artists have been increasingly professionalized, most notably and precipitously in the 1960s with the rise of the MFA as the terminal degree, grants earmarked only for professional artists, and art school classes routinely taught on professional practices which is not to say that artists shouldn't buck against the trend of packaging themselves for easier consumption, which of course they should. Still, I want to acknowledge that there is a lot of diversity in this room and many conflicting understandings of how it might be possible to make a living doing your work. If there is a space for art outside the state and the market, following last night's panel, it is, as Deirdre put it, the space of embodiment that is separate from the total administration of everyday life. It's within this space that it also makes sense to redefine professionalism so that it does not denote walking lockstep to the beat of the neoliberal entrepreneurial drum, but rather managing yourself, practicing an ethics of care when you engage with mm. others. We might call this minding your business. And I don't mean business in the white collar sense, but the interrelational ways in which we move through the world. Professionalize has become an overly simplistic catch-all dirty word. <coughs> But no one on our panel is saying that artists should scheme to functionalize art to make a quick buck. As we understood it, the question was not, should artists sell out? Because who's going to agree with that? Nobody. But rather, how do you want to acknowledge the circumstances of your own production within a highly compromised economy? Let's be strategic about how we contribute to those structures and be tactical about how we might interrupt or stall its ruthless logic. <coughs> None of us think, by saying yes to this question, that artists should head for the galleries or put on business suits and take their marching orders from corporations. Or if we do, as both Jeff and Candace have pointed out, we take our cues from Canadian conceptualists who professionalized as a kind of drag, humorous, parodic, and incisive ways to reimagine the affiliations between collaborations and ideas of incorporation with all its interestingly absorptive and bodily overtones. Instead of should artists professionalize, we should ask, how should artists profess? Profess, of course, has many meanings. One of them is to declare oneself skilled or expert to assert knowledge. But it also means to lay claim to something falsely, insincerely, or deceptively. 
I think artists should profess by accepting their expertise as well as their wily ways. I call for the professing of professionalism, <laughs> ironizing and making strange professionalization, turning it upside down to curdle it, to estrange it from itself. Instead of being forced to answer yes or no to this totally false binary, let's reframe the question. Should artists and critics profess what they believe in, be more transparent about the stakes of their making and how they support themselves? Yes. Should artists and critics be self-aware of their own circulation within frameworks of power, of their own implication in larger systems of financialization and self-management? Yes. Should artists advocate for themselves and for social justice more broadly, with an understanding that their fights might have some surprising resonance with other questions of inequity? Yes. Should artists also organize with an awareness that they have certain class privileges due to cultural capital, even if that cultural capital does not always easily translate into actual political power or long-term financial security? Yes. Should artists fictionalize rather than financialize, make shit up, falsify, infiltrate? Yes. Should artists with art school educations be aware that just because they are underpaid does not mean that they are underclass? Yes. Should art historians and critics acknowledge our profound privilege as tastemakers? Yes. Should we all take more risks, but all the time acknowledge that the risks we take are not equivalent to many other people's and the risks they live? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Am I back? OK. Um, yeah, so here's where I am on this issue of artists as creative workers. Artists are creative workers. We have done, um, I come from the visual arts space uh, originally, and I think that in the visual arts space in particular, we have done artists a tremendous disservice, not being able to articulate their labor as such. I think in order to really consider artists as a creative workforce, the first thing we need to do in our field is get really, really honest about how money moves from institutions to the artists, for artists that behave outside of the institution, and for all the artists that exist in peripheries in between. This has been my largest finding over the last three months, is that we don't even talk enough about how capital moves for artists to then be able to take it one step further and advocate for them as workers in a larger movement. The second thing we would need to do is to really untangle how we think about culture and class. And back to Julia's very salient point that oftentimes artists do have cultural capital. They are oftentimes not, they are underpaid, but not under class. This is a large swath of the artist population. This also does not mean that working class people are not artists. And we need to find a better way to talk about how we are such a multi-class hyper-regional and cross-disciplinary community. And I think in order to do that, the first thing we have to do is dismantle disciplinary boundaries between how we organize, which was really important early at Artist Relief, and I think will change the nature of my work for as long as I live, that there's no way to make this case for artists as a creative worker unless we're willing to get deep into each of these sectors, bring them together, and then work hyper-nationally across them all. The last thing, so the first, is we need to talk more about money in our field because people don't actually understand how it moves. The second is we need to literally do better at coalition building between all of our disparate disciplines and um, various regions and all of the different ways that they operate. And then the last thing is this idea that um, artists, um, this thing Julia brought up about how the fights we fight for ourselves inevitably help others. You know, some of the rooms that I've been in a little bit about orienting artists and sort of understanding them as a workforce and as a creative class is that it will help artists which it undeniably will, any fight we enter with domestic workers, transportation workers, restaurant workers, any of these coalitions that are eager to collaborate with us, we just have to show up. I think it's a matter of, yes, it will help our communities exponentially fight for rights like health care, unemployment insurance, things that they will need to survive as gig workers for the next many decades in our, decades in our nation's history. But more importantly, I think we help other people. And beyond that, I also think we help entire swaths of our population that are both. There are no shortage of artists who are also nannies. There are no shortage of painters who are also bartenders. There is no shortage of Uber drivers that are playwrights. And I think we've really tried to go deep into the artist relief really pool to find those folks and to understand that anything we can do to build a coalition amongst other folks will immeasurably help all everybody involved. But right now we're tripping up too much on conversations around class and on a lack of transparency on how money moves. And I think to be frank over the past three years, I have fought really 
or three months, I have fought really hard to try to figure out how to grow the coalition we have organized into a more uh, multi-industry coalition. And um, it is not a fight I think we can do any longer because so much of our field hasn't been able to fathom yet with these conversations around um, class and um, the transparency of how the money flows. And I say this because I think as someone who runs an institution, it's really made me question how we talk about what we pay artists for commissions at United States Artists. It's made me really think about being more public about all of our fellows and oftentimes the many different hats they wear, the fellows that you know are both quilters and work at a diner and figuring out a way to tell those perspectives better and a way to sort of, um, I haven't really found the world, but to make being an artist less precious um, as a way to think about really fighting for all the things that I think we need to survive in the gig economy. I can pause there. I'm very sorry, I'm five minutes over. Um, I do wanna note very quickly that I am calling in from Brooklyn, even though United States Artists is in Chicago. Uh, Brooklyn it sits on the land of the Lenape people. Um, and the land of the Lenape people covers all of Manhattan, almost all of Brooklyn and swoops down into Delaware and across much of the early sort of Eastern border of the Midwest. But I do uh, want to note the Lenape Center in Brooklyn is remarkable. So in lieu of a more traditional statement, if anybody is from Brooklyn and on this call or in New York at all, I highly recommend a donation to the Lenape Center, uh, which has really risen to the COVID crisis um, and is run by artists and have done a remarkable job. Um, I can maybe open for questions with Heather and Chelsea um, if we are ready to do that. Sure, well, thank you so much, Dina. Um, for that incredible video and also the start of this conversation. Um, I wanted to ask before we dive into the Q&A box, um, you talked about how you're, you're sort of digging into the cross section of artists that are artists and, you know, wait staff or bartenders or any, any other job that they are probably using to support their arts. Um, are you also working to, um, change the minds or shift the minds of people that don't see themselves in art, as artists but have art in their lives always you know there's art all around us the clothes we're wearing the things on our walls are you also working there or is that later yeah so i think a few things actually if i can have that and i do want to know and i'm sorry when i was first asked by after to do this i thought i would show up with all these plans and now I can't stop thinking about this class and languaging issue, which is where we are because the work can't move forward until we struggle with these questions. I don't think artists have other jobs to support their art. I actually think that's a frame that has to shift. Mm -hmm. Artists have other jobs to support their lives because art cannot support their lives. And I think we have to do a better job of articulating what it actually costs to be alive today in various parts of the country and all of the things that artists have to do to pay rent, pay for healthcare or medical care if they can even afford that pay for various insurances, take care of their groceries. And I think for a long time, the idea was artists had other jobs so that they could make their art because that's where their passion lies. And I don't know that that's true. Artists have other jobs because they're living in poverty, right? Or they're living in extreme financial precarity. And I think we have to do better sort of really just lifting the veil on that thing and talking about why it is that artists need other jobs because art in and of itself is largely unsustainable for most people in the country. The second thing is this, this idea of like who gets to identify as an artist, who is encouraged to think about their artistry, be it a hobby or be it a, a more professionalized practice for lack of a better word, I think is a little bit complicated. We have really struggled with this at Artist Relief, incredibly frankly. You know, in our first cycle, we had 55,000 applications. And in our second cycle, we had 25 after we tightened the eligibility of who we consider an artist. Mm -hmm. This was not easy and it led to a tremendous amount of discord at the coalition. How were we defining who an artist was? What about a commercial photographer? What about a tattoo artist? What about an artist who makes paintings in their spare time? Do these things count? I don't have answers for that, but I do think the more people we allow to identify themselves as artists, the easier it is to advocate for our sector as a whole. And I think for me, the idea of working multidisciplinary is a first step, right? It was unbelievable to us at Artist Relief that when we invited the documentary filmmakers in, they were like, thank you for referring to us as artists. Or the fashion designers in, they were like, us? And I think even just reaching across our disciplines feels like a step. And then we can get into the complexities of who gets to decide they're an artist, 
and why have we held that word away from so many communities? And really, this is just framed again by the empire and how we think about institutions today and the ways in which um, crossing into becoming an artist oftentimes in the US is about issues of access and class. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A box. So yep. from an anonymous attendee, um, part of what I'm hearing in your comments about artists being seen as both not working class, but also as relatively non-essential because their work is not practical or pragmatic. That's a public value issue and a very American thing. How do we begin to tackle that? Yeah, I think for me, and I've, I think I've said this so many times at this point that I'm like turning into a little bit of a broken record. I feel like the thing we are probably lacking the most to shift the public's imagination is less explaining to them what artists do and more uh, demonstrating artist perspectives on the world. You know, a few things I've really been struck by the last few months is oftentimes when there are rooms to tackle how to reopen from COVID or when there are moments to think about uh, the future of our nation in this incredibly tense time, if there is ever an art representative, which usually there is not, if there is to be one, it is almost always a philanthropist and not an artist. And it's because oftentimes, I don't think people trust that artists can speak on what is happening in the world, which all of us know is not true. We all do this. We all live and work in service of artists. Many of you are artists and administrators, and we know that artists' opinions and ideas about the world are critical, oftentimes incredibly researched, and usually they have strategies for how to think about the world. But I think we have uh, sequestered artists into a space where oftentimes the only thing they get to talk about publicly is their work um, or a specific project that interests them right now. And again, I've said this a thousand times, I wanna see an artist on a, a nightly talk show. I want to see an artist on a news broadcast. I want to know what artists' thoughts are on uh, the latest stimulus bill. I want to know what their thoughts are on this upcoming election. And I don't just want to see a poster they make about it. I want their language. I want their ideas. And I feel like we don't have enough infrastructures to present artists as part of civic society. Um, and, uh, but I don't know. I, I've been thought a little bit on that, that there have been opportunities and they, and they haven't been done in a way perhaps that is too public, but I think artists are soothsayers and I think artists make intangible things possible, right? And I feel like if we're gonna get through any of this, we need to ask artists what their strategies are to survive the world. And it isn't always an art project. Sometimes it's just a mediation or a meditation on something. And I wanna see that. And I think that helps start to shift it. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. I, mean, I just wanna start like a talent agency for artists, you know? Um, and I think another thing is if we are to do that, I do want to caution and the we, the sort of large collective we in the sky. I think we need to be like every other industry that does this, sports, um, beauty, we need to be really, really strategic. Who are the artists that represent the collective us well? Who are the artists that can capture the public's imagination with their language? There are plenty of them. And I think we need to uh, make sure they're in front of cameras and behind microphones at every turn. Definitely. Um, so we'll turn to one more question, I think, before we close, and it's a good one. Um, do you find that there is race, uh, a race slash privilege barrier to being identified or identifying oneself as an artist um, or a rejection of the artist label because of its elitist negative privileged associations? Yes, uh, I think it's different for different communities, um, both uh, demographically, regionally, and um, disciplinarily. So for example, I've learned kind of the hard way at USA that oftentimes architects don't refer to themselves as artists because it's considered a bad thing. You're seen as being flighty or sloppy or, or, or not someone who's capable of getting something done. So I think artists shifts right in each of these disciplines, depending on who you ask. As for issues of race and class and geography and, and regionally, I think in some cultures in our country, our multicultural country, to be an artist is an extreme um, act of provenance, right? It is you are upheld in your tribe or in your village or amongst your community as, as someone with wisdom. And so I think in, in those places, people really grasp for that language. They guard it, but in a way that feels like honors the tradition from which they're from. 
in other places, I think people don't feel comfortable saying that they're an artist until they have some kind of professionalized degree or status or have been brought into the institution and clipped away from the periphery. So I think again, back to the video I, I played of Julia, I think the thing here is it is so diversified across the board and to it, there is no one way to do it. Um, I do say that when we were launching Artist Relief, many people, including at APTA, warned us about using the word artist and that we'd actually have an easier time getting this work done if we used words like creative worker or cultural practitioner. And I fought them on it very, very, very arrogantly and was like, artist is who we're advocating for. We just need more people to realize that they're artists so we can do this thing. And I was wrong. If we had actually used words like cultural practitioner, creative worker, I think we could walk this thing more incrementally towards releasing artists from the empire and giving it back to the people, which is where it started. But we're not there quite yet. And so I think now I'm learning to be more cautious with where people are and, and, and meeting them there and then walking them towards this, um, what I think is a liberation for our sector. Excellent. Um, so we're almost out of time. I wanted to acknowledge that we have a question about um, the things that you're reading or engaging in uh, to, to learn more and to continue to com contemplate the transparency of the flow of money. And so I'm not gonna ask you to answer that now because we really don't have time, but I'm gonna suggest if you have resources that we can include those on your um, session page after this so that if any participants want to engage with those um, resources, they can do so in that way. Um, so just wanna thank everyone again for being here with us today with Dina Hagag. Um, for our session around today's theme of reimagination and resilience. So I will pass it back to Chelsea for last announcements before we go.